Hi, my name is Simon Bennett. I've just joined the Mozilla security team and I'm here to talk about security testing in development and QA. I'll start off with an obvious question. Why do developers and functional testers need to worry about security? Isn't that what security teams are for? So I'm going to turn that around. So you're developing an application you expect will need to support a very large number of users. Do you just concentrate on the functionality and then hand it over to a performance team two weeks before it goes live and expect them to make it scale? Hopefully not. You need to consider performance in all phases, i.e. in the architecture, design, implementation and testing. In the same way, security must be considered and tested throughout the project lifecycle. If you bring your security team in just before it's supposed to go live, there's a big danger they'll find critical security issues which could require a significant re-implementation or even redesign for your application. In order to develop secure applications, you really need to use a security development lifecycle. I think security testing and development in QA is an important part of that, but it's something which is only rarely performed across the industry as a whole. Security testing is a very specialised area and something that most people in development and QA know little about, which is probably why it's usually overlooked in these stages of developing a product. Luckily, there are tools that will help you, and I'm going to talk about one of them now. It's called the OWASP Z Attack Proxy, otherwise known as ZAP, and it allows you to perform security testing on web applications using both automated and manual techniques. Hopefully you've heard, all heard of OWASP, the Open Web Application Security Project. If not, then head over to owasp.org and have a good look around. There's lots of really useful information and many other great projects on there. ZAP is a security testing tool. It's completely free, open source and cross-platform. I'm the project leader for it, but it's a community project and there are lots of other volunteers working on it around the world. It's used by professional penetration testers, but when I released it, I was actually aiming it at developers and functional testers. Usually, you'll point your browser directly at your application. Although if you're in a corporate environment, your browser may well be configured to use a proxy or firewall. ZAP is an intercepting proxy, which means it sits between your browser and the application you are testing. So you need to configure your browser to use ZAP as its proxy, and possibly also configure ZAP to use a proxy or firewall that your browser was originally pointing to. In this session, I'm going to show you how you can use ZAP to perform semi-automated and completely automated security testing on your web apps, starting with semi-automated testing. You'll need to download and install ZAP, and the easiest way to, easiest way to find it is to use your favourite search engine and look for OWASP ZAP. Go to the OWASP homepage for ZAP, and then click on the download ZAP image and download the installer for your platform. There are installers for Linux, Windows and Mac OS. You also need Java installed, but there are no other dependencies. When you first start ZAP, it will prompt you to accept the license agreement and then suggest you create a root CA certificate. In this case, I've already done that. ZAP works with any browser, but obviously I'll be using Firefox for this demo. ZAP can listen on any port, and you configure that via Tools, Options, Local Proxy. In this case, we're listening on localhost port 8090. If you need ZAP to connect via another proxy or firewall, then those details can be set via the connection screen. You'll need to configure your browser to use ZAP as a proxy. In Firefox, you need to go to Options, Advanced, Network, Settings. And here we want to put in the same information as before, the, uh, the details ZAP is listening on, so localhost and port 8090. And do remember to make sure that you haven't got localhost or whatever other address you're using in the no proxy for box.
there are some commercial security tools that say you can just point them at your target app, log in, and then they will do the rest. I haven't been that impressed with them. In my experience, humans are much better at navigating around web apps than computers are. You can use Zap in that way, but I recommend you navigate around your web application manually and try to invoke all of the functionality. I'm going to use a simple app that's designed to be vulnerable called the Bodget Store. It's also open source and available on Google Code. So this is the Bodget Store, which is also running on my computer, and I'm going to quickly navigate around it and fill in some forms. If we now look at Zap, we can see there's more information in the History and Sites tabs. In Zap, if you double-click on a tab, then it's maximised, which makes it easier to see what's going on at this screen resolution. You can double-click on the tab again to go back to the standard layout. So the Sites tab shows a hierarchical representation of your application. And the History tab shows all of the requests made by your browser in the order they were made. If you click on entries in either of these tabs, then the corresponding requests and responses will be displayed in the request and response tabs. And if you right-click on any of these entries, then you'll find a whole load of extra functionality available to you. The Alerts tab shows potential issues that Zap has found, and we, we can see that it's already found some. This is because Zap passively scans all the requests and responses and reports any potential problems that it finds. Now, in this case, Zap does not make any extra requests on your behalf. So we've already found some potential problems just by using Zap as a proxy. We want to do a much more thorough security test of this application, so we're going to start by using the spider. The spider has its own tab at the bottom of the screen, but you can also access it via the right-click attack menu. So the spider is now crawling this application, looking for any pages that we didn't find manually. Note that when it finds new pages, it puts them in the sites tree with a spider icon. When you visit these page pages manually, the icon will disappear. As I mentioned before, you could just use the spider to explore your site, but I do recommend you manually explore it first and just use the spider to find pages that you've missed or were hidden from you. Now that the spider is completed, we're going to use the active scanner. It's important to realize this will actually attack the web application, so you must only use the active scanner on your own applications or applications you've been given explicit permission to run a security test on. Otherwise, you're probably breaking the law. So the active scanner has gone through all the pages that we found manually in using the spider and formed a number of attacks on them. For big applications, this can take some time. I've configured Zap to only use a subset of the normal test to speed up this demo. And as you can now see, Zap has found some more high-risk vulnerabilities, including SQL injection and cross-site scripting. So it's really useful, and you can use that when you're doing functional testing. So you can concentrate on the functionality, and then use the Zap Spider and Active Scanner to find potential security vulnerabilities. But you really have to manually explore your application first. What will be really useful is a completely automated way of doing this. Many web developers use tools like Selenium, WebDriver, and Wittier to test their web applications. So a build tool like Apache Ant will control a tool like Selenium, which will drive the browser. 
again, we can insert Zap as a proxy and also control Zap directly via the build tool. Here we have some very simple Selenium tests for the budget store that I'll kick off using Ant. So what's happening now is Selenium is driving the browser. This is a very effective way for testing web UIs. Developers can write test cases which drive their applications in the way they expect their users to use them. I'm a big fan of aggression tests like these. They give you a level of confidence that any changes you've made haven't completely broken everything. They can't test everything, so you would still want QA to give your application a good test. And we can see here that these tests have run successfully. So the tests will hopefully have tested most of the functionality of the application, but they will probably won't have included any security tests. But the tests do drive the web application like a user. So I'm going to kick them off again with some small enhancements. And as you'll see, this time, Zap is now automatically started. So what's going to happen is the tests are going to run as before, but this time they're being proxied through Zap. So this is exactly the same as the sort of testing we did before, except we're using Selenium tests to explore the application instead of doing it manually. We'll then be able to control Zap via the REST API um, to kick off things like the Spider and Active Scanner. This will give us some level of automated security testing that you can include in your continuous integration. It's important to understand there are some types of vulnerabilities that cannot be found using automated scanning. If security is important for your application, then you'll still want a security team to perform a review and penetration test of your application. But hopefully the basic vulnerabilities should have been found and fixed early on in the development cycle. As you can see, Zap is now running the spider, so it's being controlled by a REST API that can control many of its functions. And here we can see the spider is completed, and we're now kicking off the active scanner. The spider and active scanner has a, have a REST API that's asynchronous. So the ANT task has started, the active scanner is now polling it to see how far it has progressed. And now we can see the, rep the alerts found by Zap have been re are reported, and we can see that once again it's found the SQL injection and cross-site scripting vulnerabilities, which are, are very, very critical. So if you, can, if you do this as part of, say, your overnight testing, you can be alerted within a day of a security vulnerability being introduced into your code. All of the software I've used in this demo is open source, and details of how to set it up are linked off the Zap homepage. So hopefully, you can now start using Zap in your development lifecycle. There are some more advanced options you can play with, but there's one worth mentioning now. Hopefully, you're using anti-cross-site request forgery tokens, and if you aren't, then you probably should be. Make sure that the names of the tokens you're using are, in the, are configured within Zap. Do that via the Tools, Options, Anti-CSRF Tokens page. So you need to make sure that the names of the tokens are included in this list. You should also ensure that the active scanner handles anti-CSRF tokens as well.
So here are some links which may help you. There's a link to the Zap homepage on OWASP, uh, but the Zap download, source code, and wiki are all on go the Google code page. There are two groups that can help you, uh, ZA Proxy users and ZA Proxy developers. There's also two Twitter accounts, ZA Proxy, which is used for Zap announcement, and SignOn, which is my Twitter account. If you have any questions, you can ask them now on Twitter or via IRC. That is, if you're, watch if you're watching this live. If you're watching recording this event, you can still ask questions, but just use Twitter or one of the groups mentioned on the previous page.